Well, some pushback to a major public school overhaul. The state now requiring schools, as you may know, to remove those Native American imageries and team names. Here from a school official who says they need more information before they can move forward with their plans. Hi, everybody, and welcome to Empire State Weekly. I'm Ryan Peterson here in Albany. State Education Department giving schools until the end of this school year to find a replacement for all mascots, team names, and logos that contain any Native American imagery. Now, while some schools are taking to the change and working to find replacements, other districts are resisting change. The only exception for schools to keep their mascots is if they have approval from a recognized Native American tribe. Those who do not comply are at risk of having school officers removed and state aid withheld. The Mahonison District here in the Capital Region says they are waiting for more guidance from the State Ed Department before they make any decision. And we're pleased to be joined now by Shannon Shine, the superintendent for schools for the Mahonison Central School District. Superintendent Shine, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. So let's talk about the interaction, at least the communication you have had with the state ed department so far regarding changing the, this imagery and, and mascots and, and where you stand in that process. Well, it's been a somewhat uh, one-sided or unilateral communication to date meaning that last Thursday, I think I was just as surprised as uh, many other districts who uh, may have Native American uh, imagery or names or nicknames or mascots throughout the state. Uh, the state education department put out a memo on uh, Thursday at the end of the day. Uh, it immediately caused uh, quite a stir uh, because it was um, uh, abrupt might be a kind term. Uh, it was a bit threatening in that, uh, hey, we have something that we want you to take care of. We're not going to tell you the ground rules yet. Those are still coming, but you have a deadline. And if you don't comply, um, we may take away state funding for your school district. Uh, and we may remove uh, officers, which I'm assuming might be myself uh, and or boards of education members uh, from your district. So they they definitely have our attention. The deadline is the end of the year, end of the academic year, from what I understand. Is that correct? That's my reading as well. Right. It, it, is yours a little bit different from what I understand from things that I've read? It may not just be imagery and mascot we're talking here, but the actual name of the school district? That is a, that is one instance where Mahonison, uh, it stands out from the crowd. Uh, hmm. There may be other examples, but I'm not aware of them. The very name Mahonison is made up of uh, three tribal names from the Iroquois Confederacy, the Mohawks, the Onondaga, uh, and the Seneca, Mahonison. Uh, so we're not clear with this memo coming out of, uh, is our name okay? Uh, is that um, something that they're concerned about? Is it not? Is it the warrior name only? Or perhaps it is our, we have a logo, uh, which is historically ap accurate, representing the three tribes, and it shows three Native Americans in headdress. Um, we also have a, an M we've been using uh, for several years that does have a spear with a uh, a feather or a tail on it. So our question is, what are you concerned with? You know, mm. New York State, uh, is it our name? Is it our uh, logo? We don't really have a mascot, which seemed to be the their main concern. We don't have people uh, dressed up in Native American costumes or imagery. Uh, we don't have any caricatured images of Native Americans. So, you know, we feel that uh, we're being respectful uh, to Native Americans. However, if there's a difference of opinion from the state, we're very much open to a dialogue. We just want it to be sure. civil, civil uh, diplomatic, polite, uh, and non-threatening. I, I would think if we're, we are getting into outright just names here, uh, we're talking hundreds of cities and towns and, and lakes and rivers and all sorts of things across the state of New York that, that would need to be addressed. And I, you know, I grew up learning that a lot of these names were respectful and and we were named that way in in honor of the indigenous peoples that once truly inhabited these lands long before we were here that's true uh you know some things do change over time mm -hmm. uh, you know i think a more universally accepted uh mm, conclusion about names such as the redskins uh, might be less well, controversial. It was something that may have been honoring at a time. Uh, it has certainly fallen out of vogue. And I think most folks think mm, that that may not be the most appropriate. But then you have everything else, such as the name Mahonison, such as our rivers, our towns, our streets. Uh, and 
I don't think as many people feel that there's any sort of inherent inherent disrespect uh, or slight um, intended. I, I know uh, we've been contacted uh, by our uh, community members, our parents, uh, the Board of Education and I have been contacted from people saying, hey, we, we think our our namesake is honoring to Native Americans. So I think there's room for discussion on that. And there's a range depending on, are you talking about the Redskins or are you talking about the Mahanasan warriors? And again, we're, we're open to discussion, um, but we just like a respectful approach. Absolutely, no, and certainly Redskins would be an exception there. I didn't mean to, to include that at all. That I think most people would agree is a name that should have been changed a long time ago. Is this something, in, and has the state indicated at all that they're bringing in perhaps members of these tribal nations uh, to talk about this and join in in the discussion? Because this is something a lot of them have been, and indigenous peoples have been trying to change for, for, for decades now. Uh, the state only made one specific mention uh, to uh, speaking with authorities from uh, different different tribal organizations, mm -hmm. uh, but it was still vague. It was uh, basically the, the districts might be able to look for an endorsement, and in our case, it might be from the uh, Iroquois Confederacy. Okay. Uh, however, they, they didn't spell it out clearly enough, so the, the memo really left us with many more questions mm -hmm. than it did answers. Um, but again, it appears there's a deadline and we need a lot of clarification in order to move forward successfully. How much would your, would your student body play into this in, in, in an eventual decision here? Is this something you would consult with them on? Uh, absolutely. Mahanasan has a long history of uh, soliciting input from our students, from our faculty and staff, from our parents. Uh, again, board members are uh, elected officials. They don't work for uh, any additional compensation. So they're there uh, representing the community. And whenever things have come up, uh, for example, uh, we had some staffing reductions a number of years ago, we heard from the community. Uh, during COVID, uh, we heard from the community like I've never seen before in my career. And that mostly revolved around uh, masking and other uh, mandates uh, and safety protocols. So we're, we have a long history of listening and we're ready to listen as uh, this unfolds. And what have you heard, if, if anything, from, from some of the students so far? That, are they surprised and, and as shocked as you are? Uh, they are, and again, part of uh, their shock comes from the fact that they, they don't have enough information. Right. So what they're hearing are sound bites, maybe from the media or from word of mouth. Uh, social media actually got a little bit out of control after the memo came out mm. uh, with some inaccurate information saying, hey, the board is changing the name. I even had specific names put out there. Hey, you're going to be the Rotterdam Raiders, for example. I, I have no idea where some of that comes from. Uh, it looks like speculation and our students are, are among that group. So my approach and the board's approach is to be transparent, to communicate everything that uh, we have or receive or come to find out, and then to be um, open and receptive to any dialogue because we're not clear where the latitude may lie, but if the state can clarify that for us, then we need the input to help make any decisions that might be um, up to us. Social media got out of hand, you don't say. I can't believe that. <laughs> Superintendent Shine, thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate it. Have a great Thanksgiving and thanks for uh, checking in on us. You got it. A new month long push hopes to see more New Yorkers learn about adoption. When we return, what the state is doing to help orphans as they mark November as Adoption Awareness Month. Remember, if you've got a comment, story idea, please let us know. Email Empire State Weekly at Gmail or find us on Twitter. All right, welcome back to Empire State Weekly here in Albany. I'm Ryan Peterson. November is National Adoption Awareness Month. And to mark the occasion, state officials are launching a new public awareness campaign. The new effort is called the Hashtag Be The Change NY campaign throughout the month. Office of Children and Family Services encouraging New Yorkers to educate themselves on adoption. The effort comes as the state is dedicating over $4 million to support adoption related services. We caught up with the commissioner of the Child Office of Children and Family Services here in the state of New York to talk more about the effort. 
Commissioner Poole, thank you so much for joining us as we talk about this National Adoption Month. I'm delighted to be with you, Ryan. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So this initiative, uh, as I did a little research, began as a National Adoption Week back in 1984 under President Reagan. And in 95, President Clinton declared the entire month here. So now we're in 2022. What, what are the biggest issues you and your office are really trying to make people aware of, especially when it comes to adopting older children? Wonderful, yes. So that really is, I think, uh, our biggest challenge here in New York, not just in New York State, but across the country, is raising awareness. Sometimes um, folks think of children needing to be adopted out of foster care as right young children and, and babies, and those are often how prospective foster and adoptive parents, you know, think about engaging with, um, with the system. But, you know, in truth, there are a number of children um, you know, older youth who um, who really want their forever family. And so we've really been um, trying to make sure that those young people have a voice in talking, um, for example, through our heart gallery, um, through awareness events that not just OCFS, but local departments of social services have been doing throughout the state to give young people the opportunity to talk about themselves, talk about their dreams, talk about you know, their skills and assets so that mm. folks really understand that these children who are in care through no fault of their own um, are really seeking their forever family. According to some data from, from 2021, across the country, there were 114,000 children waiting to be adopted who were at risk of aging out of the foster care system. So why do you think it is so difficult for older children and especially teenagers to get adopted? What do you, what do you think is holding people back? Well, the, you know, the issue isn't the kids, right? The issue mm -hmm. is finding adults in our right. communities who, right? I mean, it's, it's challenging to raise teenagers, <laughs> um, period. Um, those of us who have raised them and lived through it know, right, that their developmental needs and just going through the angst as we all have, <laughs> Um, in our lives, um, you know, are challenging years for all of us as parents and, and children in foster care, right? Often who have lived in other in a number of foster families and who have had their own very difficult life experiences can really bring um, unique challenges, right, to their uh, foster and adoptive setting. Um, and so we do a lot in New York State to make sure that prospective adoptive families really understand the children that are available, that we provide through 16 permanency resource centers that we have across the state resources so that adoptive families have access to counseling, access to experts who can help them, especially if they've not previously parented a teen, you know, understand what this child's behavior may really be reflective of. So many kids, as you know, Ryan, um, in care, have had very um, traumatized histories, right. right? And that manifests itself um, in, in behaviors that sometimes are, are need extra support for our adoptive families. So we've been putting a lot of resources in our state to make sure that uh, prospective adoptive families and those um, interested in, in parenting teens, first of all, understand these amazing young people who have incredible talents and abilities, who have become incredibly resilient as a result of the fact that they have been in care and they need a loving home, right, to be successful as young adults. So we're doing our very best to make sure that young people um, have that opportunity to tell their story. And we've had some amazing success um, with families who are taking in, you know, that they get a real affinity right. for serving teenagers. And in fact, the, the national uh, theme for this month this year was small steps, open doors. So what are, what are some of the things, and you've, you've talked about New York State being successful, how successful have, have you been over recent years? Yeah, so you know, the pandemic obviously, like everything right, yeah. in our world, 
you know, um, impacted, um, right? Our family court system, you know, and court processing, which is a big part of adoption finalizations, um, paused. So unfortunately, during the pandemic, right, we saw the number of finalized adoptions decrease. I'm, I'm happy to say um, that with our partnership with the courts and of course all of our family judges, right, mm. Um, love nothing more than to sign that that final adoption consent paper. So we are starting to see the numbers of adoptions, um, you know, increase here in New York State. Uh, and Ryan, I hope that you've seen the recently launched public awareness campaign um, that we have. So our our slogan here in New York is "Be the Change, New York." Right? Really um, challenging all of us as New Yorkers to consider being. Uh, an adoptive resource for New York's children. I, I've covered events before in those children and family courts where the judges, yeah. you know, they, they throw a, it's, it's really like a party, right? When they, when they do those signings, it's incredibly emotional and moving. It's wonderful to see. Before I let you go, for children that, that unfortunately do end up aging out of that foster care system, yeah. are there any resources that, that remain available to them to, to, to help them out? Sure. So in, in New York State, and this is, you know, New York has been ahead of the curve, you know, for many years, mm -hmm. we allow kids in foster care to stay in care under the custody of the local commissioner until the age of 21. Um, so we encourage young people who don't have a permanency resource, right? And again, this is challenging with young kids who want to be independent and who right in some instances has spent a lot of their years living in foster care their first instinct is to i want out but we do a lot of work to try and really encourage young people to stay in so that they have the support of a caseworker that they can get ongoing financial support uh, we have um, services and funding uh, we really try and encourage young people to pursue college so mm -hmm. there's funding available for them um, housing, as you can imagine, is a big challenge um, for young people leaving care. So we want young people um, who have not found their forever family to have at least one adult resource in their life, that person that they can have Thanksgiving dinner with, that that person they can go to when they're on college break, even if it is not. Um, you know, their adoptive resource. So we count on our local departments of social services and our amazing um, not-for-profit foster care agencies and adoption agencies to really help these young people. Sheila Poole, Commissioner of the New York State Office of Children and Family Services, we appreciate your time today. Thanks for joining us. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for your interest in our work, Ryan. The Cannabis Control Board has issued its first batch of dispensary licenses. Out of more than 900 applicants, only a handful of licenses were given. We'll have the breakdown for you. And remember, you got a comment, story idea? Let us know. Email EmpireStateWeekly at Gmail or find us on Twitter. Welcome back to Empire State Weekly. I'm Ryan Peterson here in Albany. This week, the New York Cannabis Control Board approving the first retail dispensary licenses in state history. The board approved 36 retail licenses after they received more than 900 applications. The applicants had to prove they were negatively impacted by the previous state marijuana laws. They also were required to prove they have business experience here in New York State. Now, the 36 were issued despite the fact that there's a lawsuit challenging the application process that is currently prohibiting the licenses from being granted in five regions across the state. In the judge's order, the judge allowed us to move forward with nine of the 14 regions. So that's what we did. All the uh, card winners this, uh, this time were folks that were not in the, in the enjoined areas. Newly signed legislation will allow college athletes to make money from their names and likenesses starting early next year. Governor Hochul signing that bill last week which will take effect on January 1st. Student athletes will be able to appear in advertisements for businesses or make other appearances without the risk of losing their scholarships. The bill also requires the NC2A to provide athletes with additional services to help their education and personal well-being. 
All right, stick around. We'll be back with a look at the week ahead in just a moment. And remember, here's your reminder. If you got a comment or story idea, let us know. Email Empire State Weekly at Gmail or find us on Twitter. And finally, from us here in Empire State Weekly, with Thanksgiving comes the start of the holiday season, of course, and with that comes the possibility of a worsening public health outlook. We're going to continue to keep an eye on the response as public health officials recommend taking preventative measures to stop the spread of RSV, COVID, and the flu. Because we have flu vaccines, we have COVID vaccines, we have testing, we have the option under certain circumstances with good judgment to wear masks where appropriate in indoor congregate settings. So we can do a lot to mitigate any surge. Dr. Fauci in his last appearance at that White House podium there. All right, for now, from all of us here on Empire State Weekly, I'm Ryan Peterson in Albany. We'll see you back here next week. And don't forget, you can catch us all over the state. Here's the full schedule of Empire State Weekly on 10 television stations across New York.